Today is Veterans Day, and in honor of those who served in our armed forces, AMC proudly presents the premiere of Stars and Stripes, Hollywood and World War II. This AMC original production, a commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor and the start of the USO, looks at how the motion picture industry opened its heart and pooled its talent to support America during the time of World War II. In 1941, when America went to war, so did many of Hollywood's greatest stars. Not only did they enlist in the armed services, but through the United Services Organization, they entertained our troops, both at home and on the front lines, and they hosted bond rallies and celebrity tours. They made hospital visits, and they participated in the famous Stage Door Canteen. That was in New York, and the Hollywood Canteen out west. Through rare, never-before-seen photos from the stars themselves, newsreel footage and film clips, this hour-long special chronicles a very special time in our nation's history. So with that, let's join an all-star lineup, which includes Bob Hope, Dorothy L'Amour, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., Roddy McDowell, and our host, Tony Randall, as they tell us their story of Stars and Stripes, Hollywood, and World War II. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Here we are, out of cigarettes, and yawning, look how late it gets. Tune straight, pay, 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 by dawn's early light. Too much in love to say goodnight. Oh, crazy. We, we may as well have been sound asleep when Pearl Harbor stunned us into the realization that closing our eyes wouldn't keep the war in Europe away. When we finally woke, two things were frightfully clear. The world was in danger, and fascism had to be stopped. Hollywood, the romping ground of our screen deities, might have seemed an unlikely place to be a vital center of support for a war. After all, Detroit could make tanks and Pittsburgh steel. But what resources could a land that made make-believe provide? What resources, indeed? He was a famous trumpet man from out Chicago way. He had a boogie style that no one else could play. He was the top man at his craft. But then his number came up and he was gone with the draft. He's in the army now, a blow and reveille. He's the boogie woogie bugle boy of Company B. They made him blow a bugle for his Uncle Sam. It really brought him down because he couldn't jam. The captain seemed to understand. Because the next day the cat went out and drafted a band. And now the company jumps when he was reveling. He's the boogie woogie bugle boy of Company B. I christened these Thunderbirds. And may you rain bombs on Berlin and Tokyo. In hindsight, World War II was a remarkably innocent time. Before television brought celebrities into our living rooms and air travel shrunk the earth, movie stars were the sophisticates in an unsophisticated world. Hollywood, like the rest of the country, rolled up its collective sleeves. Back then, this wasn't corny. It was just plain old life. Off with the stockings, girls. They're due for the discard, and a war effort needs them. In a silk and nylon campaign, the government is asking us to turn in our worn-out silk and nylon stockings. Not new and good ones, but worn-out stockings. So motion picture starlets contribute theirs. Film star Lynn Barry collects the stockings at the 20th Century Fox Studio in Hollywood and is helped by another star, Alice Faye, in inspecting them. There's an explosive reason for the silk and nylon drive. The stockings will be used in making powder bags for firing heavy guns. Let's see how the silk and nylon bags filled with powder are used. Girls, here's how your worn out stockings will go to war and hit the Nazis and the Japs a great big sock. It's a very difficult time to understand World War II now because we're so far removed and it was a much more innocent atmosphere 
Remember, we were in a time when the motion picture was, I think, the sixth largest industry in the United States. That's a tremendous thing to uh, appreciate. So all, all the people who peopled that profession had a very, very high profile. The first stars to throw their weight against fascism did so before we entered the war. Like the rest of the country, Hollywood had its isolationist leanings, but a few brave individuals persisted in speaking out. Well, there was a great feeling in the film uh, industry that uh, people in the film industry should not come out publicly and take sides in any political matter because it would affect the uh, film business. And from that point of view, they're probably right, it would affect it because it, it's so controversial. But um, a few of us, Jimmy Stewart and myself, uh, were two of the ones who spoke out to begin with, and uh, just because we didn't give a darn. America's number one movie star joins the big parade. James Stewart, winner of top film honors for 1940, volunteers for his greatest role, but private in Uncle Sam's army. Swapping a $1,500 a week Hollywood job for $21 a month as a rookie, the lanky screen idol, once rejected for underweight, makes the grade this time without a hitch. Oh, how I hate to get up in the morning. With Pearl Harbor behind us, other Hollywood patriots joined up along with millions across the country. Tyrone Power, Robert Montgomery, Clark Gable, Someday I'm going to murder the beauty. Jackie Coogan. Someday they're going to find him. Robert there. Taylor. I'll amputate his Some of them had portrayed soldiers in their own films. But this time when the fighting began, there was no one to yell, cut. Dawn was just breaking. And uh, the first streaks of light were visible. And our boats with our fellows had been in a raid. We're making off from the shore very slowly because it didn't want to create a wake which was so visible in the dark that the water would churn up and look so white and they'd be a target for the Germans who were trying to find them in the dark. So the boats would have to go painfully slow uh, and it was terrible temptation to speed up and get out of range of the guns. So I was standing next to a fellow officer who we was standing shoulder to shoulder behind a hillock just looking over the top. I looked around and I won't go into details, but he got it. That was about as close as I wanted to get to the last act. Back home, the knowledge that our screen heroes were signing up became a tool for enlistment offices across the country. When local theaters showed Winning Your Wings, an Air Force recruiting film starring Jimmy Stewart, thousands of young men decided to join the fight. And why wouldn't they when he described it like this? Uh, what you're going to see next isn't considered exactly a part of the regular training course. But you're a chump if you don't include it in your curriculum. And you find out the effect those shiny little wings have on a gal. And it's phenomenal. Gable narrated a recruiting film called Wings Up for Officer's Candidate School. When Rhett Butler urged you to join, it was hard to say no, even when he made it completely clear what you were getting yourself into. Look out, mister. Here it comes. Oh, you're a real estate agent, mister. You're looking around as if you want to buy the place. When you hit that bottom step, you come to a brace with your shoulders back, your stomach in, your feet at a 45 degree angle, and your hat straight. Jump. Oh, you're in it now, mister. These screen stars turned fighting men were Uncle Sam's most persuasive mouthpiece. There's no overestimating the impact of knowing that such idols were facing gunfire, too. I had heard later on that uh, they were rather hoping that uh, it would be good propaganda if I would get wounded. Probably not killed, that would be going too far, but if I got a nice juicy wound, that would be very helpful for recruiting purposes. But I managed to get out of that. Ninety day wonders were what the new officers were called after the three short months of training that transformed them into leaders of fighting men. 
They had much to learn and little time to do it in, and the movie industry was indispensable in speeding their way. At home, men who had worked in the motion picture industry as civilians were assigned to the first motion picture unit and other units of the Army Signal Corps, where they made thousands of training and orientation films. The most important was Colonel Frank Capra's Why We Fight series, which clearly traced the rise of fascism and its threat to the free world. Even Walt Disney Productions joined the war effort, as artists put aside their drawings of Donald and Mickey and turned their talents to animating the principles of aerodynamics instead. Uh, I'd like to give up my Maxwell to the salvage drive. I'm Jack Benny, the movie star. Well, I never happened to have seen you in pictures. At home, it became a patriotic duty to join the fight in every way we could. We gave up our nylons, our butter, our meat, our gas, but most importantly, we gave up our cash. Those in Hollywood put their famous faces to work. This time, though, they were playing themselves. Bye, 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 buy a bond. And by and by, the bonds you buy will bring you victory. Bye, 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 buy a bond. And we are standing by the victory arch when Johnny comes marching home again. Oh, you should need no request. For after all, you know that you're investing in the best. Till the lads come back again, Judy Garland. Back the old attack again, bye, bye, bye. The price tag on World War II was $350 billion, ten times that of World War I. War bonds sold by a star-studded sales force footed nearly a third of that bill. The first tour they worked out for was for me to go throughout New England. We went on that tour, and I've never seen so many people in my life. We would hit sometimes five and six cities in New England in one day. And there would be thousands, I'm talking about like 45 or 50,000 people, almost every place we went. And it was marvelous. So I started selling bonds and I started selling them in cash, you know, not just signing up for them. I just wanted to see how much we could get in cash. So before I knew it, I would have five million, six million dollars that I had collected, seven. And in those nine days, it ran up to 30 million dollars in New England alone. For 25 bucks, you got a kiss or an autograph and the thrill of seeing a movie star right there in your own town square. To see an idol like Carol Lombard, who died tragically in a plane crash coming home from a tour, parade down Main Street, now that was an event. We didn't miss a truck stop or a bus stop or a train stop. Tiny little towns. And it was a big thing for them. A couple of hundred people come out, you know, come out from the farms. I remember riding in a tank in some parade somewhere. You know, they, they, these huge war bond uh, rallies that uh, one was an exhibit in order to help that effort. I'd say, blow the siren, you know, in the middle of nowhere. And they'd open up the siren, chickens would scatter, and <laughs> cows would turn around and look at you. Rain or shine, they were there. And I was there a lot of times with my raincoat, my hood on, and my umbrella, and my boots, with my, just about my face sticking out, and that was about it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but we'd sell them. We'd sell them. Any bonds today, bonds of freedom, that's what I'm selling. Any bonds today, scrape up the most you can. Here comes the freedom man, asking you to buy your share of freedom today. Ah, money stamps today, give kiddies, we'll be blessed, we all invest in the USA. Sammy, ah, my Uncle Sammy. Here comes the freedom man. He can't make tomorrow's plan. Not unless, unless you buy a share of freedom today. Any stamp, any bond to it. Ronald Reagan, aren't you ashamed of yourself robbing from your own daughter's bank? Well, what's the big idea, you bandit? Now, don't fly off the handle, Jenny. I'm going to invest it for her. Invest it in what? The safest investment in the world. United States defense bonds. Here, take a look at this. Well, what are we waiting for? As this team of dedicated salesmen traveled across the country, the front page headlines traced their every move. Hollywood victory caravan to bring stars galore to the city, read page one of the Detroit Free Press. 
for one night's work raised $60,000 in bonds. Nearly 500,000 of Boston's otherwise sensible people yelled themselves silly at their favorite movie stars last night and didn't care who knew it, the Boston Herald wrote about an event that added $78,000 to the pot. But a Washington Post columnist put it best. They came, they saw, they conquered. Baby, won't you please come home? You know your little mama's all alone. After the difficult training and even more difficult goodbyes, our servicemen headed off for camps all over the world where they were far from the familiar comforts of home. Second to the danger of combat, the most demoralizing part of soldiering was the feeling of isolation. The USO had been created to serve as a home away from home for servicemen, wherever they may be. Those who were fighting at the front were especially in need of support. And bringing flesh and blood entertainers to these troops was as important as it was difficult. Baby, won't you please come home? You may. It had to have looked like a vision or a mirage. To be stationed in northern Africa without a familiar sound or image for hundreds of miles and see Francis Langford on a hastily constructed platform breaking the desert silence with a song. When the entertainers who traveled on what the USO called the foxhole circuit stepped to the front of their makeshift stages and saw a thousand tired soldiers burst into grateful applause, they knew there wasn't a theater on earth that was more important than this. Pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. Even before Pearl Harbor, the USO had begun to set in motion an intricate system of camp shows. Stateside, there were two circuits that brought entertainment to army bases and naval stations here on our soil. And there was hardly a star in Hollywood who didn't participate. In your old kit bag and smile, smile, Your kind indulgence. The Mercury Theater welcomes all you servicemen to an hour or two of magic, hanky-panky, hocus-pocus, and humbug. We trust you like to be fooled. We hope we fool you. I tell you, it was so cold in my room today that a St. Bernard brought up my breakfast. His brandy keg was empty, <laughs> and there was scent scent on his breath. I, personally, I just moved from California, flew in on an army truck. My stomach will be here in two weeks. But I, I do want to say it's a pleasure to be here. I have a song that I used to do in a show called Let's Face It a couple of months ago, and it's called Melody in 4S. It's the story of a select thief from the time he gets his questionnaire and his physical examination and is assigned to a class. Hey, young pup, your number's up. Performers who toured with the USO were likely to have a room to change in and a decent bed. 
But the foxhole circuit was another story altogether. The closer to the front, the greater the hardships. But the greater the hardships, the more powerful the rewards. If you would have liked to have had your morale picked up, all you had to do was walk across a stage and you would have gotten the biggest hand. The yelling would have been absolutely tremendous. The whistles, fantastic. You had to cross that stage thinking, God has put me on the face of the earth for this. You're there and as far as your eye can see, uh, they're, they're up in trees, they're hanging on telephone poles, and when they'd get a certain uh, distance, of course, you, you lost them, uh, only in as much as being able to see them. You knew they were there because of the thunderous applause and the yelling and the screaming. Ladies and gentlemen of Germany, I promise you something. And do I or do I don't keep my promise? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we want peace. Universal peace. And I will have peace. Peace of Sweden, peace of Norway, and a piece of Czechoslovakia. Joey Brown was the first Hollywood star to travel to the front lines. In 1942, he lost his son to the war. He spent the next three years traveling to every theater of operation, performing for millions of boys as if each were his own. Hello, boys. Marlena Dietrich's sister was a prisoner at the Belsen concentration camp. She took a particular risk in traveling overseas. Her name was on Hitler's infamous death list. Mommy. Other Hollywood celebrities traded star-studded premieres for makeshift stages overseas. Paulette Goddard, the Andrews sisters, Martha Ray, all joined the effort as soldiers in grease paint. Very happy to be here. We've been hearing about this place ever since we arrived. We arrived last Tuesday. They said, wait till you get out to that jungle training center. Yes, sir. Lovely, too. This is a concentration camp with pineapples. Look at this. Bob Hope and his troop, Hope's Gypsies, they called them, first caught the bug for entertaining the troops on an airfield 70 miles east of L.A. In May of 1941, when Hope took his radio show to the soldiers at March Field, he had no idea that that 70 miles would turn into thousands by the end of the war. I was doing radio, you know, at Sunset and Vine for NBC, and uh, this uh, producer of ours said, they want you at uh, March Field uh, next week. I said, March Field, where's that? He said, Riverside, California. It's an Air Force base. I was supposed to be... Bob Hope's guest on his radio show that night and he said we're not going to do it in the studio we're going to try something new and go out to March Field. The show started and I have never heard so much applause in all my life and Bob was so excited I've never seen him that way since or before. Frances Langford was one of the top singers and radio personalities of the day she traveled with Hope throughout the South Pacific and Europe, along with dancer Patty Thomas and comedian Jerry Colonna. And Jerry Colonna would come out, and he would mince around, sing a couple of songs, do some jokes with me. They used to die at Jerry Colonna. Katie, beautiful Katie, you are the only girl that I adore. Of all the things that helped lift the GI's spirits, nothing worked like the sight of a pretty girl. I just want you boys to see what you're fighting for, that's all. In the official booklet put out by the War Department for all entertainers traveling overseas, female performers were advised on what to take along. Your most important baggage is your stage wardrobe, it reads. Take an artificial flower for your hair. When you go buy bobby pins, pick up an extra bottle of nail polish. Remember, a GI wants you looking like the girl back home on a Saturday night date. My hair was very long, it was down to here at the time and blonde. <laughs> I wanted to keep my hair blonde, so I brought all this peroxide along, and I'd put it on my hair at night and go to bed and leave it. And the next morning, no way to wash it out, I would just brush it real hard, and I didn't go bald. But I stayed blonde. Well, I think right in here we ought to have Francis do just a little snatch of the song. Would you like to do that? Yeah. How about Mother doing a little song right here? I'm in the mood for love. Simply because you're near me. 
can make them laugh and the girls can make them smile and that, that, that's all you need. Even in baggy army fatigues, these USO entertainers were invaluable in boosting the soldiers' morale. Knowing they'd come all that way to sign a few autographs and sing a few songs was enough to lift the GI spirits for months to come. I'm in the mood for love was always a favorite <laughs> because I could start, I'm in the mood for love. And the minute I would say that, some guy, I don't care where you were, would say, you come to the right place, sister. And it, it looked like somebody went ahead and told somebody else to say that. Do you think they all think alike? I guess they do. <laughs> Here's a letter that a serviceman wrote home. Dear Mom and Dad, well, guess what? I am now in a large hangar waiting for Bob Hope's show to start. Five boys from our barracks just went into Sacramento to a hotel and picked up Skinny Edwards and his band. Bob Hope, Jerry Colonna, and Francis Langford just came in and walked right by me. Colonna nodded. Sure would like to get an autograph. And a line down is Jerry Colonna's signature. When it comes to understanding the USO, that signature says it all. While I'm undressing, saying my prayers and lightly confessing, I can hear hot licks from a set of drums upstairs. Well, it couldn't be Johnny, cause he isn't there. Johnny's overseas, we know not where, but believe it or not, every night on the dot, I can hear a tenor drum say, Billy Dick, Billy Dick, tick tack. When's that character coming back? When's that kid in the GI lit gonna choo choo down the track? Me, I'm as beat as can be, and my rim has even started to rust. Look at these sticks, trying to tick out the licks. They're covered with an inch of dust. Beat the dust, Billy Dick, Billy Dick, tick attack. The first 2,343 American GIs were killed on day one at Pearl Harbor. During that same 24 hour period, almost 1,800 others were wounded. It was just the beginning. The tour that I made, it wasn't in 1941. It was when the boys were coming home from Germany after the Battle of the Bulge. And that eastern seaboard has a lot of hospitals. And I visited all of them in that three months. And the doctors, the doctors in Germany and France didn't have time to put them back together again. So they put all of them in body casts. And as I would be talking to a young man with the face of an angel, I would see that they were going to cut off both arms because there was a mark that he was unable to keep his arms or his legs. Or maybe it would show a bullet in his, the sternum of his chest and they hadn't taken it out yet because they didn't have time to do all that surgery. They just sent them home for the doctors to take care of them here. If one image remains etched in the minds of all USO entertainers, it's that of an 18-year-old soldier back from the front with the wounds to prove it. Visiting the hospital wards was an exercise in concentration. Your heart might be breaking, but you kept that smile on your face. They put on the list of hospitals that I would visit, one outside of Washington, D.C., called Forest Glen. Now. I had a routine all set for wherever there was a swimming pool. I would have a swimming meet with anybody, the walking wounded or whatever, because once a swimmer, always a swimmer. But they didn't tell me at Forest Glen that they were paraplegics. I go down to the pool in my bathing suit and my little terry jacket, and I say, okay, everybody that knows how to swim, we're going to have a swim meet, we're going to do a medley relay, and we're going to do this and everything. And the guys come, and here's a fellow that comes to swim, and he's only got one leg. And one of the boys, who had only one arm and one leg, dove into the pool with me and raced me to the end of the pool. I slowed down so he could win, but he did okay with one arm and one leg. Embrace me, my sweet embrace of you. I 
I did the song in Africa that um, out on the desert, we were in a hospital where they, a lot of tanks had been hit and the fellows had been burned badly. And I went into this one ward and the fellow was bandaged all out and uh, Bob said, I think you ought to sing a song. I said, okay. And I started to sing Embraceable You. And I just got into it and I realized the man didn't have any arms. Well, I quit right there. I just couldn't go on. And Bob walked in and he started telling a good joke or something, you know, but I never got over that. I just went out in the hall and let go. It's terrible. I was sitting at a table with one guy and he was asking me a lot of questions and I was at answering them back and we were just wonderful. And I, I said, I guess I, time we better go. And I got up and I felt a hand on my shoulder and I looked up and it was the doctor and I liked to stay. So I stayed a while. I thought maybe the kids were gone. The man I was talking to hadn't uttered one word in over six months. But to me, his conversation was going and going and going. A, a cure like that, only because he recognized something from home. Now, can you imagine Bob Hope in the same situation? He must have had hundreds of uh, healings like that, only because of the recognition someone from home you know you go through the hospital and you try to cheer him up you know jerry clone and i used to go walk into a ward and we'd start screaming leo well where's everybody where are the nurses where's my bed where's this because they're not used to that and when you do that they everybody in the, in the place starts to chuckle you know because they're used to people walking around quiet and everything clone you say i love life and i want to live da, da, da. and they just sit up and look because it it, it really was so different than anything that they experienced, and it was the it was the way to go. I used to do things that were fun because, of course, being young, uh, you could do things you don't stop and say, "Is this the right thing to do?" I'd climb in bed with them. I just it, it just seemed to me with their broken bodies, what a wonderful thing just to get real close to them. It's it's frisky and a little naughty, but when you're young, 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 you you can do those things. Esther Williams was one of the popular pinups of the war. She may be the only Hollywood starlet who posed for pictures in a hospital bed. They said, you are going to do these. And there were the exercises that the doctors had, the physical culture guys, had come up with um, to have the boys do every single day while they were recuperating. And those pictures, when you're practically standing on your head and you're throwing your pelvis in a direction so that you are strengthening your back muscles because you're lying in bed all the time. I mean, I never laughed so hard in a portrait sitting in my life. Most hospital visits were a time to talk one-on-one. -on -one. You'd ask a soldier where he grew up and whether he had a girl back home, but you learned never to ask, how do you feel? Because most of the time, you already knew. One was close to the front. I went into a tent, and he, um, he was very, very sick. And the doctor said, just say hello to him. So I went over, and I put my hand on him, and he said, oh, don't touch him. He just goes haywire. Everything, you could touch him anywhere. And I forget what you call that, but it was so bad. And I sang a few bars, oh, I'm in the mood for love for him, you know. And he smiled. And he said he was from somewhere, and I couldn't remember. It was hard to hear him. And we said goodbye, and the next morning he was gone. You go back and you ask about them. And there's an empty bed. At the time that the war broke out, the old 20th Century Fox lot on Hollywood's Western Avenue had stood abandoned for years. With its vacant buildings and deserted streets, it had the strange, creaky quality of a ghost town. But in May of 1942, a circus in military uniform moved in. 
Overnight, the old Fox slot became what Bob Hope called the military madhouse. Armed Forces Radio had arrived. Stand by, Americans. Stand by, servicemen of the United Nations. Here's mail call, selected by fighting men as one of the three top radio programs presented regularly by Armed Forces Radio. From 64 American expeditionary stations, 140 government-owned and foreign commercial stations, 118 overseas camp radio installations, and from dozens of powerful shortwave stations beamed all over the globe, transcriptions of this program reach every American overseas who can find time to lend an ear. Their mission was an important one, to provide high-quality radio entertainment featuring Hollywood's biggest stars and to distribute it around the world wherever American soldiers were based. Recruited for the job were some of the most talented writers and producers radio had seen, including one of Bob Hope's ace joke writers, Sherwood Schwartz. Talent was in abundance. Military order was not. At 6.30, it's very hard to be funny. We were comedy writers, so we took to uh, leaving after roll call and going off for coffee. And the Army didn't take kindly to that. And Captain Petito, who was regular Army, said anybody who isn't in his office immediately after roll call is going to go on detail. We didn't. And he said, OK, everybody on detail. And so we had to put our fatigues on. And we had to uh, pull all the weeds from the officer's parking lot. That was our detail. And along came Major Peterson. And he saw us pulling weeds when he arrived. And he said, who's writing mail? Who's doing G.I. Joe? Who's, do who's writing all the shows? So he went to see Captain Petito. And he said, Captain, when you find men who pull weeds for a living, you can punish them by making them write jokes. It doesn't work the other way around. <laughs> the studio facilities were donated by NBC, CBS, and the other large broadcasting companies. It was there that programs with titles like Command Performance, Yank Swing Session, G.I. Jive, and Yarns for Yanks were recorded in front of live soldier audiences. Most of them were variety shows. A little music, a little comedy, maybe a report from the front. And all you had to do was listen to the humor to know that these shows were written especially for the boys. Yes, sir, it's the G.I. Journal again, your radio newspaper of the AEF, the paper that prints all your contributions from overseas. Men on the target range, a bull is a clean hit. Well, here's a man who, while he may not be a hit, is definitely a lot of bull. Your original editor-in-chief, Kay Kaiser. Well, hiya, men. Hiya, Kay. Oh, well, well, well. Say, men, it's sure a man size helping a pleasure being your editor again. This is your five-star final, and standing by are your five-star reporters. So then, of course, our star outside reporter, Professor Colonna, who ought to be calling in with a big story right now. Uh, hello? Uh, hello, city desk? Hello, desk. This is Kelowna. I'm overseas with the ground troops. We're on a forced march. A forced march? Really? Yes, and we're carrying full field packs and everything. We're really loaded. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a swell time, and I slept right in the barracks last night with the boys. You know what barracks are. That's 2,000 cots separated by individual crap games. <laughs> by the way, Rochester, what's your brother doing? My brother's in the infantry. KP division. What's that, KP? Keep peeling. <laughs> Well, I read a poem, Jack, and I'd like to read it. Now, 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 wait a minute, Mary. You cannot read the poem. The poem's out. Jack, you let me read my poem, and I'll tell all these boys here that when you were in the Navy, you went up to the crow's nest looking for eggs. <laughs> but why are men so crazy about sweater girls? I don't know, Judy. That's one mystery I'd like to unravel. We had access in the Army to any star we wanted. So, and you didn't have that in civilian life. In civilian life, you had budgets to worry about. That was wonderful. You didn't say, let's get somebody like Clark Gable. You got Clark Gable. You didn't say, let's get somebody like Bob Hope, who was number one in his field. You got Bob Hope, or Durante, or any, any of the others. Hello, young man. I sort of remember you from someplace. You're, uh... I'm a private sad sack. Another chapter in our story, the life of Sad Sack. <laughs> we pick up our story when the Sad Sack was first born. 
The proud father looks at the tiny bundle and says to the mother, You're supposed to keep the baby, not the store. <laughs> But the sad sack proves to his parents that he is a brilliant child. At the end of his very first year in school, he comes running home with the happy news. Mm -hmm. Mama, I, I got skipped to the next class. They gave me a med. I've been expelled. <laughs> Fast and romance came to the sad sack. He met the girl of his dreams. He tries to make love by serenading her. He holds her hand and sings. Hey, what am I gonna get, a kiss or a quart of milk? <laughs> Mother says it's in the groove. Daddy says it's hot. Backwards, it spells Lila Bouge. Now, brethren, what have you got? You've got Jubilee! There was something for everyone, and there's no estimating how a snappy beat or a good belly laugh helped cheer up millions of homesick soldiers who were battered by combat or stagnant with boredom. Maybe the old Fox lot was a military madhouse, but these inmates knew just what their fighting men needed. Command Performance USA, the greatest entertainers in America, is requested by you, the fighting men of the United States Armed Forces throughout the world. By far the most popular show was Command Performance. The idea was simple enough. Soldiers wrote letters requesting sounds from home. Everything from a song to, well, more specialized requests. Tonight, we believe we have the most unusual request made to date. Here is the letter. Special Service Division, War Department, Los Angeles. Dear Command Performance, we feel we could win the war single-handed if we could only hear Carol Landis sigh. That's all we want, just to sigh. Sign Jimmy Doc and Big Mac somewhere in the South Pacific. Okay, fellas, don't forget your promise. Carol Landis will now sigh. <sighs> the chirping of newborn chicks, held by Ginger Rogers and Alice Fay. The cackle of a frying egg, cooked by Veronica Lake. The roll of dice, thrown by Dottie Lamour. And Ann Miller tapping in army boots. No sound was too outlandish. Their request was Armed Forces Radio's command. Well, gang, command performance has filled many an order for those sounds that remind you of home, from the bleat of a billy goat to the fizz of a bourbon and soda. And now comes the ordnance gang at 863 with a letter from Sarge Everett Hanke and Corporal Roland Lipton and this little billy. It says, Dear Command, enclosed, please find peace off top of Stuka Dive Bomber, for which you will please have Lana Turner come out and fry us a three-inch porterhouse steak smothered with onions, and let's hear it sizzle. Just to prove there's no request too large, fellas, here she is, Lana Turner. Hello, fellas. Hi, Bob. Say, have the FBI men found a steak yet? Yes, it's backstage, but Lana, <laughs> this is dangerous. If this audience sees steak, they'll come right up here after it. Oh, I don't know. They've seen ham all evening, and you're still here. <laughs> Right now, I'm bacon. <laughs> Lana, let's get on with this thing. Be a good girl and let's fry that steak, huh? Okay. Bring on the porterhouse steak! <laughs> well, look, they got an armed guard around the steak. <laughs> oh, look at this. <laughs> well, all right, Bob. Is your griddle hot? Yeah, I think so. I'm home, I'm home. But the most ambitious production ever staged by Armed Forces Radio was a bona fide all-star extravaganza. We did a show one time 
which was uh, an opera, a Dick Tracy opera. Who's that knocking at my door? Who's that singing through the door? Bringing song to my boudoir? It is I, Dick Tracy. Bob Hope was flat top, and the Bing Crosby was Dick Tracy. Frank Sinatra was a character called Shaky. Dinah Shore was Tess Trueheart. I mean, it was a cast that you dream about. Hiya, Dick. Give me some skin. Thank you, Scad Tess Trueheart. There was a scene in which uh, Flat Top in the, in the script came came up to Dick Tracy and he said, he said this is Flat Top. Flat Top. Put him up. Who's that? Flat top, and I got a gun in your back. Stick him up. <laughs> then the mole, who was Jimmy Durante, was supposed to say, this is the mole. Put him up. I'm the mole. Stick him up. <laughs> and instead of that, he said, this is the mole. Shove it up. And <laughs> the audience collapsed. It was like a five-minute laugh. And the, the, <laughs> the censors felt that that was unfit for our boys' ears, and that was deleted from, from the show because it was too vulgar and, and anyway, that, that always struck us funny. Here are guys out there uh, dying in the field, and this was, was too much for their gentle ears to hear. So. Um. The radio shows that reached those gentle ears from the jungles of the South Pacific to the deserts of North Africa all had one thing in common. They all spelled home. When command performance fulfilled requests for the sounds of foghorns in San Francisco or cabbies fighting in New York, it was really bringing servicemen a reminder of life before the war. And on those days when a soldier would spend one hour too many deafened by gunfire, when he was so beaten and broken that abstract words like democracy and freedom could no longer inspire, the familiar songs and sounds of Armed Forces Radio Service brought back into clear perspective why the fighting was worth the price. Beyond the rainbow, why, oh, why can't I? Pardon me, boy, is that the Chattanooga choo-choo? Yes, yes, back 29. Or you can give me a shot. When servicemen on leave in unfamiliar cities were looking for a little recreation, they knew they could find a friendly face and a welcoming smile at the local USO clubs. The USO was charged with providing fighting men with a little good cheer and had set in place hundreds of servicemen clubs around the world. The food was free, the volunteer hostesses were pretty, sometimes, and it was one way that a community could express its appreciation, and the entertainment community was no exception. The Hollywood Canteen on Sunset and Cahuenga and New York's Stage Door Canteen in the heart of Broadway were the two most famous servicemen clubs. Here's where the kings and queens of stage and screen showed who they felt the real royalty was. On Wednesdays and Saturdays, when I wasn't working, my mother and my sister and I used to go to the Hollywood Canteen, and I was really a busboy there. I used to go there quite often. We'd dance with the boys, and we'd have hot dogs with them, or dinner with them, or something like that, you know. We had a ball. The Hollywood Canteen was founded by Betty Davis and John Garfield. It was built from the remains of an abandoned nightclub with the help of the construction unions who waived their fees. Servicemen only were allowed through the doors, and once inside, you never knew who might be working. Some of the biggest name you'd see down on the hands and knees scrubbing the kitchen. You know, it's wonderful. Coffee and donuts and coffee and donuts. They had sandwiches for them, too. And you'd say, where are you stationed? I'm only in town for 48 hours or 24 hours or 12 hours. I was very serious about clearing the tables. <laughs> Just, <laughs> that's a big issue with me. Big names and small names. The boys didn't care. Somebody to dance with and somebody to make them feel important. Listen, I spent a good deal of time when I was at uh, the Hollywood Canteen getting autographs of the other people who were there. No one 
upsetting to nerves, no bad patients, a nice smooth drink. Pour a little in your glass and drink it right down, but be sure and ask for Guzzler's gin, a nice smooth drink. <laughs> <laughs> On opening night, the floor show at the Hollywood Canteen featured Eddie Cantor, Dinah Shore, Betty Hutton, and Abbott and Costello. Kay Kaiser and Xavier Cougat frequently brought their bands, and sometimes Marlena Dietrich would sing. At the stage door canteen, you were likely to see a few numbers performed by the cast of a current Broadway show, and Ray Bolger was always a favorite among the troops. Without much more ado, <laughs> Uh, I will do the best. <laughs> Looking back on it, it was so simple. In fact, when talks about it, I say, well, what's so great about that? What was great about it was the spirit and the uh, combined effort to do anything one could to make that group of men feel they were needed and wanted and belonged. myself. That's not in the script. Any indications of how powerful they were. Even before we entered the war, when Germany was still an important market for films, some of Hollywood's most talented mavericks succeeded in making movies with anti-Nazi themes. Right in the purest You know, you're quite famous in London, Colonel. They call you Concentration Camp Earhart. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, we do the concentrating and the Poles do the camping. <laughs> Ernst Lubitsch's satire, To Be or Not To Be, was widely attacked upon its release. Many critics were disturbed by a movie that found humor in the Nazi rape of Poland. Some went so far as to accuse Lubitsch of endangering our war effort by treating the subject too lightly. But Lubitsch was firm. Is whipping and flogging the only way of expressing terrorism, he said? American audiences don't laugh because they underestimate the Nazi menace, but because they are happy to see it ridiculed. December 7, 1941. A date which will live in infamy. Hollywood quickly changed its tune after the war in Europe became our war, too. Suddenly, Nazis were no longer taboo villains. In fact, they popped up in the least likely places. Out of the jungle comes Tarzan. Tarzan's son, a beautiful princess, and men whose only mission... I don't want no medals. I just want to get this thing over with and go back home. I can't tell them bombs to hit somewhere else. Like I said before, it's up to somebody bigger than me, bigger than anybody. What I mean is I... I guess it's up to God. But if you preferred to escape wartime reality, Hollywood movies provided options, from the sublime to the ridiculous. The lady in the tutti frutti hat. Yes, if you weren't surprised at who was singing, you were surprised at who was dancing. And if you weren't surprised at who was dancing, you were surprised at what they were dancing in. Baby on the 
swing ship. No, thanks. I'm sitting this one out. No film better illustrates the impact of wartime movies than Casablanca. If Humphrey Bogart's Rick could see past his pain, and Ingrid Bergman's Ilsa could choose duty over love, then surely each of us at home could be wartime heroes in our own small ways. Whether it meant being satisfied with our ration of sugar, or finding strength when we had to say difficult goodbyes, the movies of World War II showed us how to bring out the best parts of ourselves. That's the power that Hollywood had then. Maybe it wouldn't work today, but then again, maybe it would. He's looking at you, kid. This is the G.I. Jive, man alive. It starts with the bugler blowing reveille over your bed when you arrive. Jack, that's the G.I. Jive. Rootle de toot, jump in your suit, make a salute. Voot! After you wash and dress, more or less, you go get your breakfast in a beautiful little cafe they call the mess. Jack, when you convalesce, out of your seat, into the street, make with the feet, reap, chunk all your junk, back in the trunk, fall on your hunk, clunk, soon you're counting jeeps. But before you count to five, seems you're right back digging that G I J. On Cinemax. What makes a classic classic? A look, a smile, a moment in time. At Cinemax, we keep the class in classic by bringing you the quality you've come to expect with classics that are completely uncut so you see every frame of the original film by never interrupting those classic moments with commercial ads and by ensuring that unique timelessness with the best quality prints around. So when you have Cinemax, you know you made the right choice for classics because we give you the film and nothing but the film. Uncut, uninterrupted, undeniably the best quality. 
all the great things that make a classic classic. If you like classic movies, you're in the right place. Cinemax.